With the latest on the fight against COVID-19, I'm here with Dr. Neha Narula with Stanford Healthcare to talk about it. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Talking a little bit about breakthrough infections, it seems like at this point, almost everybody knows somebody who's had a breakthrough infection. Talk about the concern about those people transmitting the virus. Is it still possible for them? Are they at high risk, as high of risk as people who are unvaccinated of transmitting? Certainly. Um, when we see that infections are occurring in vaccinated individuals, which we do expect um, as vaccines are meant to reduce and prevent severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths, not infections entirely, the next thing that we as medical professionals and scientists worry about again, naturally is transmission. Um, and unfortunately, it is a little hard to study because most people who end up getting vaccinated and end up getting that breakthrough infection have been around both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. So where and who this virus is picked up from can be very difficult to identify. And while we don't have reports identifying breakthrough infections that have occurred in vaccinated individuals solely due to other, unvac other vaccinated individuals just yet, we do have some really awesome evidence coming from multiple areas in the world. Um, so there's a study that is um, being uh, uh, looked at more um, deeply coming from the University of Toronto. Um, and what this study has found that you know, in addition to the circulating antibodies, which are the antibodies in our bloodstream after we are vaccinated, um, they are the ones that grab onto the virus. In addition to that, they've actually found what we are calling now mucosal immunity, meaning large amounts of antibodies seen in our nasal passages in our mouth in vaccinated individuals that actually help coat viral particles should you get a breakthrough infection. So that if you are sneezing, if you are coughing, the viral particles that are leaving your body are coated with antibodies, making them less infectious. Now we're still waiting for this study to be officially peer reviewed, but some additional good news also comes from some studies um, coming from the University of Washington and the, the Netherlands, also showing that isolated virus from people who have gotten breakthrough infections is actually less viable, less effective at infecting cells as it is being transmitted to others. So um, the, the risk of transmission is happening at a much lower rate in a vaccinated individual, especially when we compare it to an unvaccinated individual in, in unvaccinated individuals. So if you're still on the fence, here's another reason to go get that vaccine. It keeps you safer from developing that severe disease, the hospitalizations, the deaths, but also keeping your loved ones, your, the people that you are in close contact with safe as well. Okay. Uh, talking about uh, making sure that the symptoms are less severe, less risk of death, Merck asking the FDA to authorize a pill to help treat COVID-19. What is it and where are we at with that? That's right. That's right. Just this past week, Merck and its partner Ridgeback Biotherapeutics have officially asked the FDA for emergency use authorization for the antiviral molnupiravir. And this is meant for adults with mild to moderate COVID-19 that are being treated as an outpatient, um, but are at risk for developing severe disease or are at risk for being hospitalized. And we saw this in the news a couple weeks ago when they released the initial press release and um, talked about the data. This medication is an oral antiviral pill and that's been shown to decrease hospitalizations by 50%. So the group that received this medication, only about 7% of the patients went to the hospital compared to about 14% in the placebo group that received no medication. And there were no deaths seen in the group that received this medication. This was all phase three trials, very promising results. And the way this medication works is that it, molnupiravir tricks the virus as it's replicating in our cells to start making errors so that it no longer effectively replicates and continues to propagate within our body. Now, the advantages are multiple of this medication. First, it is oral. So we no longer require, um, we would no longer require a hospital setting or an infusion center to give medications to this particular group of high risk individuals. Um, two, uh, it's another tool that will help prevent um, additional stress and burden on the US healthcare system if this is approved by the FDA. Okay, but you would have to catch it before it got bad. 
Correct. Exactly. So we want to give it initially right after symptoms develop or right after diagnosis in the, the um, at patients that are considered high risk. So people that are on certain medications with chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, that particular group or um, age over 65. Um, so it'll help reduce outbreaks in the country as well as worldwide um, because it is oral easy to um, give out rather than the the current IV or um, IM injections that are being used. Okay. Um, Anything to make it less deadly. We'll take that. Exactly. Let's talk about boosters because that has been huge right now. The FDA considering boosters for Johnson and Johnson and the Moderna shots. If somebody's already had COVID-19 and they are fully vaccinated, say that they've had the two vaccines of the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, would you still want that booster? This question has certainly been up for debate this year, and we're seeing it more and more because we are seeing mandates going to affect nationwide. And the answer is unfortunately complicated, but at the end, yes. Um, without doubt, many people that have gotten infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus will have some level of immunity. And it's certainly possible that if they encounter this virus or one of its variants again, they might develop a relatively mild infection a second time around, but that is a big question mark. The level of immunity that they've incurred after a natural infection of being exposed to the virus really is going to vary from individual to individual, and that's where the problem lies. Immunity from a natural infection depends on things like age, um, health status, your the severity of the infection that you had the first time around, not to mention that being infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus now or in the future may mean exposure to a different variant than what you had initially. Um, studies also show that only about 85 to 90% of people do have detectable, detectable antibodies. And so with the variability and strength of the immunity, the durability, and also waning immunity that we're seeing in infection, in natural infections, we still are recommending vaccines to those that have had COVID in the past. It offers that additional boost to your, to your immune system. It also gives you protection against multiple variants, not just the one that you're infected with. Um, and so it, it provides you with that extra layer of protection. Um, I also want to take a moment to mention, you know, when we talk about this idea of natural immunity, we have to remember that that's relevant for people who survived COVID-19. The road to natural immunity is unpredictable. It's uncertain. Um, and, you know, people talk about the mortality rate being so low, especially in young people. And most people get mild infections. You know, I want to remind our viewers that as medical professionals, of course, we we were, uh, we care about the death rates, and we're happy to see that some groups are faring better from that standpoint. But we cannot ignore the morbidity and the long-term damages COVID is causing. Um, despite having mild infections early on, many people, almost up to thirty percent of people, are still having long-term symptoms, damage to their hearts, kidneys, brains, and it's leaving people feeling exhausted and unwell for weeks to months after. So yes, those people that were lucky enough to survive and have recovered from COVID-19, some natural immunity might be there. It's variable. We don't know, but it does wane over time. So we still recommend getting vaccinated to keep yourself protected. All right. So speaking of, and speaking of the fact that there are still so many questions out there, I mean, as pointed out through our discussion, a lot of people are, are using that as a reason to not get vaccinated at this point, specifically pointing to, oh, well, the original vaccines didn't work well enough. Now we need a booster. So people using that to say, I'm just going to forget the whole thing. What do you say to people who have still been holding out? Yes. So several weeks ago, we saw the FDA grant approval for Pfizer. Just recently, half dose of Moderna booster was is now being recommended. It was approved by the FDA. Um, uh, Johnson & Johnson still up in the air, but we'll hear more about that as well. And naturally, it has created further confusion, further skepticism. But I always want to go back to the science. We know that vaccines are essential for the recovery of this pandemic. We are now 18 months in. To this pandemic, millions of people have died worldwide. Even more millions of people are now fully and safely vaccinated. But I do want to take um, an opportunity and say, yes, these boosters are there. 
they are being blown out of proportion, but their necessity is only for a small subset of patients. We know that these vaccines work. Um, they're not perfect. That you will get you, there's a possibility you might get a breakthrough infection, but the likelihood of you getting a severe infection, dying from this disease, ending up in the hospital is so much lower. And that's what we want from this vaccine. These vaccines are very effective um, in making that happen. And the numbers are surely backing that up. Um, the, the majority of the current infections, hospitalizations, and 99% of the deaths are still in the unvaccinated groups. And just like any other disease, we also know that certain groups of people that are considered high risk, whether it's their underlying conditions, the current meds they're on, their occupation, they will not fare well um, if they come into contact with this virus because they do have waning immunity after a certain period of time. And this is the group that we're recommending the boosters for. Um, that is an extra layer for protection for them. But overall, as a whole population, we are doing very well with the original vaccines. So if you're finding yourself with these questions, these hesitations, um, talk to a medical professional. We're here, we'll, we're well-versed and can go through some of the peer-reviewed evidence, um, even sift through some of the data you're coming across or the anecdotal um, advice or um, opinion pieces or blog posts or tweets or what you know, aunt or uncle said to you at dinner last week, we, we want to, we're here, we want to talk you through it. And we'll look through the data together to clarify any confusion or hesitation that comes up. All right, we really appreciate it. Dr. Nehan Rula with uh, Stanford Healthcare. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.